Welcome to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I'm your host, certified religious transition and trauma recovery coach, Terry Hales. I help people step out of the shadows of religious fear and shame and embrace their authentic selves with love and empathy. If you're ready to throw off the shackles of learned binary thinking and explore a more nuanced approach to life, this is your playground. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I am so excited that we are ending the last couple of episodes of this year in 2022 with my husband, who's a licensed professional counselor. He does marriage and family therapy here in Colorado. Kevin Hales, welcome to the program. Thank you. I already know that this is where we're going to cut off for part two. Um, The question I've been asked is, as we are evolving and we're stepping outside of our box. So I had a um, a woman in the Facebook group say, I want to start using my voice. I want to start expressing my needs. I want to start doing things that I wasn't necessarily allowed to do as a woman before. How do I help my husband? Because I think sometimes husbands who have been charged with providing and protecting in their box, sometimes feel threatened when women want to go get a higher education, when they want to start working outside of the home, when they start speaking up about what isn't working for them anymore, because I think it does trigger some shame that we're not doing our job well enough. So let's talk about the insecurity that that can bring up when our partner starts stepping outside of their box and their stereotypical roles, and they start allowing themselves to be more fully human and not so one dimensional. How do we deal with the insecurity and the shame that that can bring up for us? Well, obviously, like you've talked a a lot about in your other episodes, a lot of this starts with that person, right? We have to be aware of our own fears and insecurities and what's coming up and be able to talk about that, you know, Mm -hmm. with our, our, our partner and our spouse. Of course, a lot of that depends on how it's brought up, you know, because if it's brought up in the midst of an argument or in a ultimatum or threatening way, then obviously that's going to, you know, make it that much worse mm-hmm. to, to have to deal with or, or work through. But um, I think at its core, you know, as you were talking about that, as you were describing those fears and insecurities, I think one of the underlying subconscious unspoken things that happens in in those situations is well it goes back to those traditional roles right if the man has traditionally been the provider and the one who's working and and making money a woman saying you know she wants to work or wants to make money might feel threatening because then maybe he feels less needed mm. He feels less important. He feels like he's uh, not doing a, a very good job mm-hmm. uh, providing, you know, for his his wife and his family. And so, and then again, if there's marital issues or struggles already going on, her wanting to work or get an education can also feel threatening because in the back of his mind, he might be wondering, is this the next step towards divorce? Mm-hmm. Are you doing this so that you can be independent of me and, you know, take half my paycheck for the rest of your life as alimony and child support and go work and, you know, live it up? And so there, there there's probably a number of fears and insecurities that come up, but I, I, I think those are maybe some of them. And, and, and again, a lot of them come back down to what are the traditional roles that we have typically filled in the past. And if you are not doing that anymore, that might feel threatening because what that says about me or what that possibly means. Yeah. What's coming up for me as we're talking about this is this idea of codependency of 
I'm not wanted and loved simply because I am. Mm -hmm. I'm wanted and loved because of what I provide to you. So if we believe that you keep me around because I provide for you Mm -hmm. and because I protect you, then if a woman starts standing up to protect herself, if she starts getting an education or starts to work outside the home and provides, like is able to create income for herself and wealth for herself, um, there may be this feeling of, well, why would you keep me around? Like my worth in this relationship is being threatened. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, you'll, uh, I've heard a, a lot of men, you know, say that in the heat of the moment, you know, during an argument, they'll sometimes say to their wife, you'll never make it without me or, mm. you know, you, you or something along those lines, the lines basically, which again is, is really a statement of I'm scared. Yeah. I'm scared of not being needed anymore. I'm scared of you're not going to need or want to be around me that, <clears throat> you know, one of my clients, I remember he described himself as a carbohydrate. He felt like his only purpose was basically to be used by uh, everyone in, in, in his family. And he mm. didn't, he didn't see his worth and value as having anything other than that. And so, yeah, so there's that, that, that's, that's been ingrained in so many men that you are the provider, you are, you know, meant to rescue and save and fix, you know, this, this whole idea that you're a, a knight in shining armor, you know, swooping in to save the day. And, and, and when, we feel like that role is threatened or being taken away or no longer necessary. A lot of us struggle to know what to do at that point. You know, what, what is my purpose? What is my worth? What is my value if if I'm not needed for, for this? And, and so losing a job, for example, for a man Mm -hmm. is almost always going to be much worse than for a woman, Yeah, because for that, for the man, again, his ability to provide. Now I don't have a job. I am worthless. You know, what is my, my purpose and, you know, use as a, as a man, if I can't even do this. Yeah. I hadn't really thought about that, that, I mean, not only the expectations within the relationship and within himself, Mm -hmm. that this is my role is to provide for you. Mm -hmm. And I think that does go back generationally. I think that is like a generational trauma thing that women often married men Mm -hmm. for their financial stability and their ability to provide. It was a survival thing. Right. Um, And I think maybe we carry some of that with us into the modern era when it's not necessarily true. A woman can provide for herself and should, should provide for herself. (laughs) Right. Like if that's, if that's what she wants to do. Right. And if that's what he wants as well, like if they've come to that, because there's there's a place for stay at home moms. That is sure. something I want to make sure that we are iterating here, because I think in the toxic feminism, there's this idea that there is no place for right. stay at home moms. There is no place for homemakers. There is no place for women who enjoy being at home and taking care of home and kids. And I want to make it very clear that their healthy humanity allows for a full spectrum of human experience. And if you have the ability to stay at home and take care of a home and kids, and it's what you want to do, and it's what your partner wants as well, it's what the the two of you decide, more power to you that, or if there's a man who wants to stay at home and do that, Mm -hmm. more power to you that there should be a full spectrum of possibility and experience for both, for all genders, right? Well, and I say should simply because, you know, once upon a time, and even (laughs) it still happens nowadays, you know, the only reason women would go to college was to find a a spouse, you know, and that was, and as soon as they found that spouse, they drop out, you know, because they didn't either see themselves as capable of going to college and getting a, a degree or didn't want to because they had been told their place was in the home, you know, being a mom. Uh, Or maybe they just genuinely, like you were saying, didn't really want to work or do any of that. And they really just wanted to be a mom at home. But again, at the end of the day, how many times have we heard those stories where the the husband dies and the wife has no marketable skills to Mm -hmm. be able to work and provide for the family? It's 
So it's yeah. it's important to education and opening opportunities is important. Yeah. For be prepared for us to be able to fully express <clears throat> our humanity. Right. Otherwise, we unconsciously do choose a box for ourselves. Right. I think is what I'm hearing you say. Yeah. 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 Without a doubt. Yeah. Because we limit our opportunities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I see that. So we have women beginning to, especially as we're exiting high demand religion, we have women beginning to say, I wish I had been able to get an education. I'm going to go do that now. Mm -hmm. Or I wish I had had a chance to work. I like having something to do outside of the home. I like being able to contribute. We've talked about how, you know, this can kind of bring up insecurity for men who have been told that their worth is in their ability to provide. What are some first or second steps that men themselves can do to kind of work with that insecurity? And what are some things that their partners who are stepping outside of the box and beginning to like, explore things outside of that like traditional femininity what are some things they can do to support the men in their life with the insecurity they might feel or that threat that they might feel well i think there's probably a lot of things that we can do in these situations a lot of different things to approach and deal with but i mean the first step to addressing any problem is an awareness that there's a problem. And so whether that's through therapy and, or, you know, reading books and, and having an open mind to these topics, that's, that's where this will always start. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the guy has to be aware that he has insecurities and that he's feeling threatened or that his value is wrapped up in his ability to work and provide and, and all those things. If he's not aware of that, then that's going to affect his ability to make room for his wife to pursue an education or work or do these other things. Or even to communicate about it. Because right. if you're not aware of it, like it does not compute. Right. When your spouse comes to you and says, hey, this is what I want to do. Or, hey, you seem triggered by this. Like, right. this seems like it's a problem. Right. If you're not self-aware, <laughs> you'll be like, there's no problem here. It's like, right. this is just not okay. Right. Yeah. So awareness is that first step. Right. And, you know, like we've talked about in some of our other episodes regarding conflict, you know, there's that, that phrase, it takes two to tango. And so we have to be aware that we both play a part in some of these, these uncomfortable comfortable situations that we sometimes find ourselves in. We both play a part in uh, triggering those insecurities in, in one another. Mm -hmm. And, and so we have to, we have to be open to that so that we can, again, talk about it and realize that, you know, you wanting to get an education or get a job that might feel a little uncomfortable or scary for me. Can I talk to you about that? Can I express that to you? Mm -hmm. So that we can then work through that together. Because I guarantee you, most, most spouses just want support. They just want to know that, you know, I'm excited for you and I want to support you, you know, to go do this and pursue your dreams. But sometimes that you know, the perceived threat of you doing this and what it says about me, it causes me to react in a, in an aggressive blaming way towards you. Yeah. And so then we'll often fall into that pattern of, well, you're the problem or this is, you need to get, you need to get your crap together and get yourself fixed, you know, so that we can be better off. And, and that's, that's never going to bode well for the relationship in the long haul. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is first there's work with self-awareness, Yeah, being able to recognize what we're feeling, admit it to ourselves mm -hmm. and then get curious with it. Right. Cause that's kind of what awareness is right. not necessarily having any answers, but just I'm feeling something. What is that feeling? Mm -hmm. And can I admit that I'm feeling that and just get curious with why that feeling's there right? and and just continue to get curious with it for as long as it takes until something bubbles up. And even if that takes a little while, right. that's okay. Um, so that's the first step is what I'm hearing. It's just that, that process of becoming aware. Mm -hmm. And the second one, what I'm hearing is 
can I communicate with you what I'm feeling? Mm -hmm. And can I be vulnerable? Is it safe to be vulnerable? So maybe that is the work that the other spouse does is creating that safety Mm -hmm. and saying, I want to know what you're feeling, even if it is really uncomfortable for both of us. Right. Can we sit with that and create safe space and both be curious with that together so that we can validate that feeling and work with it to find something that works for both of us? Mm -hmm. Like, I want to work or I want to go get an education, but I'm hearing that this feels really threatening for you. Mm -hmm. Um, Or this is bringing up a lot of fear for you. And, you know, how can we work together so that you feel more secure while I'm also able to go get the education that I desire? How do we work to meet both of our needs? Is that what I'm hearing? Right. Now, what do we do if we have a spouse on either side that is not willing to do that work. Is there anything we can do to kind of facilitate some of this conversation or? I think the short answer is yes, but I think we have to be very real with ourselves about what that is that we can do to, you know, affect or influence the other person. I'm actually working through this with, you know, a female client and, and she falls into the trap, I think a lot of us do, which is we try to control mm. how other people think about us and and perceive us and so forth. You know, sometimes we call that people pleasing. And uh, but but at the end of the day, that's what we're often trying to do. We're trying to make the other person see me in, in a certain way. We're trying to make them think of me a, a certain way. And that's 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 a big control issue that we have to learn to let go of. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's probably one of the biggest things we need to do. And, and that of course requires us to have a healthy self-identity apart from our partner. Yeah. And so, you know, that's, that's one of the, the damaging things about codependency is we lose our identity uh, when we're a codependent on someone else and our, our whole worth and values tied up in that other person. And so if they are angry at me or, you know, they're, they're not happy with me wanting to do this, then that again, feels very threatening because I can't lose you. I can't, you know, you are my identity, you are my reason for existing and so forth. And those are, are unhealthy ideas. Um, I think we've talked about that before, but I always think of that line from Jerry Maguire where, you know, he says, you complete me. And that's actually a really unhealthy idea, you know, because Another way of saying that is, I am in- incomplete without you. Uh, we sometimes refer to our spouse as our other half or our better half. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, that that seems to imply that I am incomplete. I am not a whole person without you. And so I think we have to remind ourselves that I am, or at least I should be, a whole person apart from my partner. And I need to learn how to be happy and content and satisfied and all these things without anyone else in my life. And then when we find that partner who enhances all of those things about us, then, you know, I've, I've often used the phrase one plus one equals three Mm -hmm. together. We, you know, the sum of our parts is greater than, you know, the whole, it, it, we are better off when we are together, we enhance each other's happiness and contentedness and so forth, but we're not dependent on the other person for it. And so, so to address your question, then I guess that would be the main focus I would hone in on is I've got to take care of myself. I've got to learn how to be happy and content and all those things apart from my partner. Otherwise I become overly reliant on him or her for that approval, for that almost permission, you know, to, to do those things and think those things and, and follow those things. Yeah. So it sounds like the work that we do on both sides Mm -hmm. is with ourselves first. Like we learn to become the person that 
has our back, the person that gives ourselves permission, the person that validates ourselves. And then we look for ways to be interdependent with other people, whether it's a partner or a friend or like we look for ways where I still retain a whole identity in myself, but it's okay for me to ask for support from you. And it's okay for me to ask for that interaction and that friendship and and that uh, validation as needed. Is that what I'm hearing? Mm -hmm. But I know that even if you can't provide that, like I will take care of me. Right. Because otherwise we become stuck. We are giving too much power to other people. And if you don't approve of this, if you're, or you're not happy with me for choosing this or wanting to do this, then it becomes crippling. And, and we don't go anywhere because we're sitting there waiting and hoping for that, that approval and that agreement, you know, from our partner. And, and while that might be nice and while we might want that, do we really need that? And I think that's where we sometimes get stuck is, is feeling like we need it probably because that's how we've lived most of our life, yeah. needing other people's approval and, and uh, permission to be who we are. Yeah. Well, I think pretty much anyone listening to this podcast was indoctrinated and conditioned that way right. to look first to God for his approval. Mm-hmm for who we are, and then to ecclesiastical leaders, to parents, to spouses, Mm -hmm. for that validation that we're good people, that we're on the right track. Right. Something that is coming up for me is when you're in a partnership with someone, with a spouse, there are going to be certain decisions that you make together. Mm -hmm. It's no longer two separate people living separate lives. You've combined lives to a certain extent. There Mm -hmm. is some interdependence. So what would you say in that situation where you have a marriage, where you are really exploring stepping out of these boxes and expanding your identity into more of an, I'm a whole human, not I'm feminine or I'm masculine. How do you navigate making those decisions together about going to school and who's going to take care of the kids and who's going to work and who's not going to work um, when maybe there is some fragility still there. Yeah. And, and that's, unfortunately, there's no clear cut answer to that question because every situation is going to be a little bit different, but in my mind, it boils down to how, how much does this decision affect the other person and do I even need their permission? You Mm -hmm. know? So if, I don't know, if you're a stay-at-home mom and you want to go get a job and the husband says no, how much right or you know ability does he have to prevent that from happening? Because if he's worried about the kids, well, maybe the wife has friends who can watch the kid or she's planning on getting a babysitter or something while she can go work or go to school or something. Or your kids are at school already. Or your kids are at school, right. And there's, do I really need to be just sitting at home twiddling my thumbs? Um, But if it's, I don't know, if it is, you know, going back to school and wanting to get an education, that's obviously going to cost money. And, you know, that, that, that would probably have to be more of a joint decision. And, uh, and more of a team effort. <clears throat> and so again, I think, I think it just depends on the, on, you know, the, the situation and how much of this is going to affect the other person. And uh, obviously the more it affects the other person, then the more of a joint uh, decision needs to be. Yeah. Well, and this kind of goes back to, um, I did a podcast a couple of weeks ago with Tarina Maldonado and she was talking about how so often we go from systems of power over Mm -hmm. where there is a person that is dominant that has the final say and a person that submits. Mm -hmm. And most of us coming from high demand religion, we're in marriages where at least that was held up as the structure we were supposed to have. Right. So even if they had a more egalitarian marriage, like you and I did when we were both Mormon, there was still this idea that you were the head of the household. And that if we needed a tiebreaker at some point, like you would have that final word. Right. Um, I think many of us, especially women, when we're stepping outside of the box 
and beginning to use our voice, we go from being this submissive person and we like slingshot over to the other side where we try to have power over Mm -hmm. our spouse and to be the dominant voice. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about how that doesn't really work, that we need to find that compromise voice in the middle where it's not like I'm doing this and you're going to submit, but it's more like, this is what I want. And I want to hear what you want. Like, let's find a win-win that works for both of us. And she said that that often works better. Has that been your experience, I guess, in the marriage and family therapy room? I would say eventually, yes. But that normal, you know, you you call it a slingshot. And I, I, I usually refer to it as a pendulum, right? How we as human beings, we tend to swing from one extreme to the other. And, and I, I, I would almost argue that sometimes a necessary part of learning, what is that happy medium? I don't think you just come from one extreme and go, okay, here's that happy medium that Mm -hmm. we're searching for, because you don't know what the medium is if you don't know what the other extreme is. Mm -hmm. And so I almost, I almost would argue that sometimes we have to swing to the other extreme so that we can kind of feel out what that extreme feels like and what that looks like. And I don't think it's a conscious thing. I don't think we're thinking, Ooh, I'm going to you know, <laughs> dominate. You. Yeah. I'm going to, you know, I've been dominating my whole life. And so now I'm going to return the favor. I, I, I don't, I don't think it's always that conscious of a decision for someone, but, but hopefully we again, have that awareness to get curious with ourselves and kind of go, Oh, wow. I'm really, you know, taking this to, you know, the extreme or I'm really, you know, being aggressive or, or demanding or whatever that might be. And then maybe we can learn to temper that or learn to bring it back to the middle. But that also requires a a partner who's participating mm-hmm. and willing to have that conversation. And that's part of why we go to extremes is because we're feeling an extreme from the other person. Mm-hmm. And that's, and so again, that's a very natural process that if I'm feeling an extreme, uh, opinion or, or perspective from you, I have a tendency to want to go to the other extreme. I mean, look at politics, you know, we we see that all the time, you know, Mm -hmm. you take this stance on a topic and I'm going to take the, the opposite extreme, you know, and that's why we have a tendency to demonize and vilify people on the other extreme. So, um, I I don't want to say it's good or bad that we do or don't go to an extreme. And I guess, yeah, sure. Ideally, we try to seek for that happy medium, but sometimes it requires that extreme for change to occur. You know, I can't tell you how many spouses say they've pled with their spouse, you know, to, you know, understand where they're coming from or, Hey, I'm not happy about this situation or, Hey, we need to change this or, Hey, we need to do this differently. And it's not until that spouse is like, all right, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. We're getting divorced or I'm going to go do this or something. And then suddenly there's this wake up call from the the sleeping spouse and, and, you know, they didn't realize it was such a big deal or they didn't realize, you know, or they just didn't, weren't hearing it. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they were, they were asleep. They were unaware. And, and so sometimes you'll see them leap into action at that point, but sometimes it's too little too late. Yeah. And, and, and so, but you know, uh, I think their action and their awareness at that point is more genuine, more sincere, but, but now we have to figure out, can we swing that pendulum, you know, back to the, back to the middle, because sometimes it's not possible, possible at that point. Yeah. This is making me think of the Icelandic women's, um, boycott. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you know what I'm talking about? I, I think so. Like, yeah, didn't they strike? And women and- kept saying, like, we need more equality with the work at home. We need more representation right. in businesses. We do so much work. And the men kept not listening to the women. And so they all decided as an entire island, the whole island, women did not cook. They did not do childcare. They did not show up to work. They did not do anything, all work by women for an entire 24 hours. Women did nothing. And it's like, again, it was an extreme action. They did nothing. And men were having to take babies into work and they were trying to like 
figure out how to cook dinner. And it led to a lot of discussions about how do we make this more equal? Because Mm -hmm. I think they finally woke up and said, oh, women, women really are doing a lot of invisible work here that we just never considered somebody was doing. Yeah, we, we. I think we were watching that in a documentary or something, right? Yeah. And and, and what was ir- ironic about that is um, that whole you know scenario that you just uh, described was they were inspired to do that because of all of the feminine feminism and women's marches here in the United States. Yeah. And so the United States was was initiating that and inspiring that, um, and now arguably the women in Iceland have far more rights and equality than the women do here in the U S they have the first female president or female prime minister in the entire world. Right. Yeah. Um, they have more women on CEO, like boards of CEOs and executive directors. And they have a rule that you need at least three women Mm -hmm. because one is a token two are easily ignorable and three are forced to be listened to. You have to like, if there are three women in a boardroom, you can't ignore what women are having to say. And they're finding that when women have equal representation, that things tend to be better for everyone. Mm-hmm. Because again, it's you don't just have a masculine box and a feminine box that are divided. You have those influences working together, which are inside of all of us. And we need that in society as well. Right. So You've given me a lot to think about. I love having these conversations with you because I never know what's going to come up. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I would love to hear from all of you as you're listening to this, what questions are coming up, what areas are still blurry for you, because this is a big topic. This is a lot to unpack. And it's something that I think we'll be unpacking for a while to come. It's not just one answer, like go home, you're going to say these words and boom, both of you are going to be on the same page. This is like, can I sit with myself and understand what's going on inside of me? What wounds do I need to heal with myself? Do I need a professional to help me with this? Then it's how do I communicate this in a way that's vulnerable, that isn't blaming, that feels approachable um, for the person that I'm in relationship with? Like, how do I? communicate this clearly and in a way that isn't, you know, just dogpiling shame and blame on them? How do I like create an open conversation? And then it's, can they do their work too? Because we've talked about codependency. We can't do the work for our spouse, no matter how much we care about them, no matter how much we love them. We can invite them. We can make it safe. We can ask curiosity questions. We can be non-judgmental, and ultimately they have to do their own work for us to have a partnership. Like a partnership means two people are working. And then from that place, how do we talk with one another, express our needs and communicate in such a way that both of us get our needs met. And there is no magic wand we can wave as much as we would like to. There's no there's no like quick fix. This is a process of learning ourselves, learning our spouse and creating a partnership where we can continue to talk about these things. And Kevin and I are still talking about these things. I mean, it's been years. We've been working on this for years and we continue to change and grow and age, right? And so our needs continue to grow and change as we evolve as humans. And we continue to have to kind of communicate these things as we learn more about ourselves and, you know, maybe get tired of our situation. Things that used to be fun for us maybe aren't fun anymore. And it's time to time to have a different conversation. Is there anything you want to add or say before we end up this podcast? No, I mean, I guess I would just echo what you just said now, right? There's no quick fix. You know, I I sometimes joke with my clients that I'm like, oh, crap, I forgot my magic wand at home. And I I wish I could just, you know, wave that and fix all of your your issues tonight. But, you know, you can't. It's a a lifelong process, really. You Mm -hmm. know, there is no arrival point. That's, That's one of the things I try to remind people of is that, when it comes to relationships and personal growth and and progress there is no arrival point you don't you don't just 
arrive someday and go, boom, I got it. I'm done. I'm, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm, I'm whatever I was trying to be, you know, and accomplish. It's, it's an ongoing journey. It's an ongoing progression. And, and like we've talked about in other podcasts, because we are constantly changing as individuals, the relationship has to change and evolve as well. Mm-hmm. We're not the same people today that we were five years ago, 10 years ago, you know, back when we first got married. And I think there's this old false idea of what it means to be a strong, healthy human being. And it usually seems to be connected to this idea that we don't change or we shouldn't change that what I believed back then, I still believe now, you know, you see that reflected in religion and politics all the time if somebody changes their mind in politics they're called a flip-flopper you know they're mocked and made fun of for it if somebody grows up believing god and they don't anymore they're seen as lost and deceived and and led astray by the devil and weak and and you know doubting thomas and all that crap you know so so we have to remember Strength is actually changing your mind. Strength is 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 evolving, taking in new information, and and letting that percolate throughout your mind, and and making changes as a result of that. That is strength. That that is the ability to change and to grow. Yeah, I like that you said that allowing ourselves to take in new information and change is it's strength, it's courage, because you're allowing yourself to step into uncertainty, you're Mm -hmm. allowing yourself to step into the unknown, and to explore what that means for you. Mm -hmm. And I think that does take an incredible amount of courage and vulnerability. And as we know, vulnerability is courage, right? The ability to say to yourself, "I, I don't know it all, right? I do need to learn more. Um, and so, yeah, as we're ending up this year of 2022, um, is there anything you want to say about the year before we close up? It's weird to me that this is our last episode. This is it for 2022. Yeah. Yeah. Another year under our belts and it's been quite the year again. Yeah. The, the twenties are not, not disappointing in the sense of, Throwing curveballs our way, are they? <clears throat> oh my gosh. I feel like this year, I mean, 2020 obviously was surprising because of the pandemic, but it didn't feel emotionally difficult. Like for, it, for you, it, for, for a lot of people, it was. It was. But for me, it didn't feel emotionally difficult. Like I'm right. I'm definitely right. coming at this from a very right. personal perspective. Right. Um, 2021, like I remember feeling like, okay, this is when I'm going to deal with the fallout of 2020. Mm -hmm. I know that I have some trauma from being locked indoors with my kids, the stress of trying to learn to do school online, the frustration of it all. Um, you know, really like coaching people through religious trauma. That's when I started this podcast and really dealt with the feedback. And it didn't really hit me in 2021 either. I was socially awkward as hell last year. Mm -hmm. I remember trying to talk with people and just being like, I don't remember how to people (laughs) it like face to face anymore. I can do it on a screen, but face to face, I'm really awkward. Um, But this year, I feel like it's really hit me. This Mm -hmm. year, I feel like it has been my year of reckoning for everything that's happened. And I was just telling everyone a couple episodes ago, I feel like I'm coming out of the woods. How has that been for you? Yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, it, I feel like I've had highs and lows through all the years. I, I haven't felt like anything's been overly difficult or easy. It's It's been, I don't know, just kind of a roller coaster, I would say, just mm-hmm. adapting to the, the changes and, and um, dealing with the fear and the uncertainty of what the future holds. You know, yeah. I, I think that's probably the the biggest thing most of us have had to, to come to grips with is not knowing what the future holds because we like to fool ourselves into thinking we have control over our lives and, you know, what we do on a day-to-day basis. I think this has been a good reminder that we actually don't have as much control as we'd like to think sometimes. 
we uh, uh, it's been a good exercise and I think learning to let go of some of those expectations and you know what we want to control and and be able to do with our lives unfortunately a lot of that we don't have as much control over and that's that's hard to come to grips with yeah I would say that's probably been one of the harder things for me to come to grips with as well allowing myself to get really comfortable in being uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and in being uncertain Mm -hmm. allowing myself to recognize like this is how like learning how to take care of myself Mm -hmm. in the uncertainty and the discomfort that that brings. Like, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what's going to happen with so many different facets of things that are going crazy in the world. Right. And yet like allowing myself to ground in right now I'm safe. This is what I can do to protect myself at least in the short term. Right. This is what I need to feel safe right now in the moment. Um, and just reminding myself of those things, like having those touchstones of right now I'm okay. Here's what I'm most worried about. This is what I can do to protect myself. These are the people I can rely on. And just kind of coming back to those things and calming my nervous system and reminding myself that like, I don't know what's going to happen five years from now, but in this moment, things are okay. And the things that I'm worried about, I'm working towards keeping myself safe with those things too. I think it's been really helpful. And honestly, like I'm really grateful yeah. for this opportunity to learn those skills. Yeah, I don't know if I would have learned those skills without the pandemic and everything that's happened in the last few years. Yeah. I mean, that's the irony of all the hard things that we go through is ultimately they're learning opportunities. Yeah. You know, we, we want things to be smooth sailing, maybe all the time. I don't know. Uh, but we don't really learn and grow from easy. Yeah. You know, it's it's the hard thing, you know, the hard times, the the moments that don't always go so great. That's where our greatest lessons are gonna come from. And and I think that's why we have to stop looking at those things as, you know, a failure or as a bad thing. It's maybe not desirable maybe it's maybe it's not pleasant maybe we don't necessarily enjoy it but understanding that there is learning and growth that can and should come from those those opportunities and maybe not immediately maybe that's going to take time and we have to weather the storm first before we can repair the damage but at the end of the day that's just that's that's part of life. There's always going to be those those aspects of it, and, and that's that's hard to accept. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. That it it doesn't happen immediately because I feel like the first half of this year was just me grieving mm. the life, like the way life used to be. Yeah, like the old Terry and realizing like that life is dead now. Yeah, I've changed fundamentally as a person because yeah. of the pandemic. Yeah, I would say before the pandemic, I was pretty freaking extroverted um and i loved going and doing all the time and i'm not that person anymore and i don't know if i'll ever be that person again and i almost had to kind of grieve pre-pandemic terry right that loved to like host all the parties at the house and you know go out and do all the activities and run a million miles an hour and recognizing that there's a part of me that misses her because she was a hell of a lot of fun Mm -hmm. But there's also a part of me that's really glad I don't have to be her because she was also really exhausting. <laughs> so, yeah, I almost had to like grieve her. Yeah. And then like start creating life with this new, very ambiverted Terry that really does enjoy her introverted time. Right. Um, and balancing all of that. So that's what I wish for all of you as we end up this year is just the time to sit with yourself to love on yourself if you've experienced some of that like grief and some of that loss and to begin getting curious with yourself about what you want next like what what feels good and that's really what 2023 is going to be about is after this year of learning about myself and grieving what used to be and how I used to operate coming into this new year doing things that new Terry enjoys from a way that feels good for me 
and hopefully will feel good for you. And I'll be open to that feedback as well. But we wish you the happiest of holidays, no matter what holiday you celebrate or no holiday that you celebrate. And we will be here to answer questions as you interact with your family members or don't interact with your family members. And we want to hear from you. So just because we're going off the air and taking a break for the next month doesn't mean that we will not be there to answer questions or messages on Instagram or Facebook. We'll still be having those discussions and we look forward to seeing you. So thank you, Kevin, for joining me. Thanks for having me. And we will talk to you more next year.